Hello, everybody, and welcome to the special Hallow Stream Sherlock Holmes. Jack the Ripper extravaganza. Now you have to forgive me. Um, I haven't streamed on YouTube before, so this is kind of a newer thing for me. I've done it on Twitch, which which is a little more user friendly. Well, only a little bit. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that one, I can set the latency of the stream as low as possible. So that might mean that some of the quality is affected, but I, I want to be able to ask you guys questions and then not have to wait um, like 20 seconds in between to get an answer. So hopefully um, there'll be, you know, somewhat limited of a, of a delay. Um, but I thought we would start with, well, I mean, start with Jack the Ripper, shouldn't we? This is case one, or chapter one, of Sherlock Holmes' consulting detective. And this is the first... <laughs> You're so good. Uh, yeah, help me out here, man. Um, so this is the first case um, in the Jack the Ripper Chronicles of this game. There, there are four... I mean, we're not able to catch Jack the Ripper until the fourth case, but I figured we could get started at least, and um, you know, and, and kind of uh, see what see what we can see what we can figure out. Um, I've played. Um, I've never played this this particular mission before. Um, I have done the Goldfire chapter, and I've done one other. Um, the Goldfire is already on the channel. If you've ever seen it, or if you haven't seen it before, you can you can go and watch that later. But this one is specifically Jack the Ripper. Now that does come with a bit of a Mm, kind of gore warning because it is historically or somewhat historically accurate and so there is a decent amount i think of blood and guts and other things not suitable for uh, people under the age of 18. so that's the spoiler warning or, or the, the the parental guidance warning um but yeah i mean let's get started we've got enough to get going um, we have our case book here. We have the, I believe, only one newspaper we get um, for this case. So this is the this is the London Times um, on Saturday, September first. Um, Saturday, September first is the date of. Yeah. See, things like that keep happening, <laughs> where <laughs> for some reason. The camera just keeps turning off. So let me see. Hold on one second. I'm going to try and uh, try, try and remedy that really quick. So the screen will go black for just a moment. But uh, let's see. I think if I can make it not do that, that would be that would be really helpful. So let's. Uh, Auto lock. Okay, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that that doesn't happen again. And maybe you guys will have to give me a shout out in the chat if it uh it does. Um, let's see. More. Oh, I can zoom in. That's nice. Same as you guys just saw my board game table. Yeah, I feel like Twitch is a bit, just a, a wee bit easier to, uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. All right, shall we get started? I think we probably should. Um, I'm going to probably... We'll probably do this for like maybe like an hour and see how far we get. And then we can do another session tomorrow, maybe, or maybe even Halloween night. If you guys are feeling real spoopy about it. Um, yeah, I should say my board game table is after covering uh, the PMP contest over the past few um, months now. <laughs> That's weird. Um, but uh, yeah, my board game table is just kind of chock full of scissors and paper and cubes and tokens. And just like I've never had as many board games concurrently on my table um as i do right now um but yeah we've, we've we've got this space um i should say we've got 
a map of Whitechapel. Um, we have the casebook, as I was saying, we've got the newspaper and we've got a list of informants. So the list of informants we can go and check out um, should we have um, should we have any questions or whatnot. Um, we also have the London directory, which will lead us to various um, folks that we need to talk to if we do. And so, yeah, feel free to like throw in the chat if you think that I should go check something out, please um, let me know because I'm not gonna be able to do this by myself. Or at least I very much doubt that I will be able to. So, the Whitechapel murders. Mary Ann Polly Nichols on Saturday, the 1st of September, 1888. Early in the morning, we're rounded up by Wiggins and faced with our sleep filled faces and our reproving glares, he explains to us that we've received an urgent message from Dr. Watson requesting our help. Less than two weeks after the resolution of the Lion Eyes Lions case, I'm not sure what that is. we're heading back in the direction of 22, uh, 221B Baker Street, our carriage driving at a fast pace in the morning fog. Wiggins rings the bell. Mrs. Hudson opens the door, and apparently unsurprised at our visit, she invites us up to the first floor. Watson is waiting for us in the living room, pacing. Ah, uh, gentlemen, I'm happy to see you, Watson exclaims. You guys want voices? I hear voices. Come in and sit down. I'll explain why I asked you over. Watson settles into a sofa and we copy him. We're surprised by the absence of Sherlock Holmes, but the care Watson puts into not speaking too loudly tells us that his flatmate must be sleeping in his room. On the corner of the fireplace, balanced on the coal bucket, is a case containing a hypodermic syringe and a bottle of morphine. Your message worried us a bit, Doctor, begins Wiggins. I understand. Please excuse me. How can I explain it to you? I've been watching the same spectacle for a week without daring saying a word to him. His brilliant man does not stand, as he says himself, stagnation. The absence of work, puzzles, investigations, or mysteries to solve plunges him into the most depressing state of lethargy. Well, probably the, the morphine would do that too. Without cantering his rituals, which worry me to no end. You're talking about these injections, interrupts Wiggins as he points to the syringe. Yes, I'm a witness to these sessions three times per day. He alternates morphine and cocaine to the detriment of his health. <laughs> like, that, that probably is a given, but all right. One would believe he's incapable of facing daily life in its banality. I feel you, Sherlock. I'm afraid I don't see how that could help, Mr. Holmes, answers Wiggins. Who better than you to do so? You're his friend and a doctor on top of that. I know, Wiggins, you're entirely right. If you knew the feeling of guilt which each night overwhelms me, my conscience is reproaching me for my lack of courage to protest when I see him destroy his health this way. Watson pauses before continuing. Let's get to the point of my message, Wiggins. Head Inspector Abilene came here himself to request the help of the greatest detective on the Whitechapel murder case. As Holmes is in a state to receive him, I fashioned a vague excuse and assured him I'd send our best people to help him as soon as possible. Our reputation is at stake. You can count on us, Dr. Watson. We'll find Abilene and start right away. Give Mr. Holmes our salutations when he wakes up. Thank you, Wiggins. I'm sure that Holmes will be happy with our initiative if he ever comes back to reality, and maybe he'll even be able to help us in our noble undertaking. Well, here we are in the police news. Revolting and mysterious murder of a woman in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. The murdered woman in Whitechapel mortuary. Nice illustration there. Looks like her throat has indeed been slit. And by the looks of things, they're trying to cover up some of the more grisly details well that's it that's all that's all we have to go on so we know there's a that we know there has been a murder and we know that it is in Whitechapel, and we know that we need to go and find inspector abeline now we can of course check the times um as we're in the carriage on the way i imagine um, and we've got nothing really on the front page, which I glanced over while I was preparing for this, where, while I was preparing for the stream. Um, you know, apartments, uh, news from abroad, Edison's phonograph, uh, you know, you can, yeah, we can record and things like that. Our voices now, which is, you know, what a, a lovely, lovely innovation. Um, Births and deaths, and yeah, but on the back. Oh, you know what? I think it's looking very purple. Shall we? Should we give it a little more like firelight? Kind of. No, that's a bit green. Yeah, 
you know, something like a little, little candlelight, perhaps. Yeah, there we go, a little oil lamp. All right. Um, but yes, we do have a story here, horror in Whitechapel. A woman was found yesterday in Box Row completely eviscerated. The investigators from Scotland Yard have managed to establish, not without difficulty, that it was Mary Ann Nichols, nicknamed Polly, who lived in a shelter at 18 Thrall Street of that same neighborhood. At nine o'clock, the deceased's body was moved to a separate room in the old Montague Street morgue that had been turned into an improvised operating room, and Dr. Ralph Llewellyn performed a post-mortem examination. So I believe we can go see him too. I'm not sure if he's on the... No, I don't think he is. No, he's not. On, he's not on our list of informants, but I'm, I imagine we can go check with him too to see uh, to see what he thinks is going on. Um, let's see. Well, let's go to Abilene first, shall we? Frederick Abilene, here he is, Scotland Yard inspector assigned to the case in this field, coordinates police actions. So, um, where do we need to go to find him? One would imagine. So we've got E, oh, we've got E, C, and E, so nothing too crazy. These are all the docks, these are the church, we've got the Whitechapel whatnots. Do we have some sort of shadow on the basin? Um, yeah. Inspector Adeline. Oh, it doesn't really tell us where to go, and it doesn't have a... Uh, doesn't, doesn't have a direction on the on the. Uh, I suppose we could go find him in the in the directory. Is he in Abilene? No, he is not in here either. So perhaps we just need to go to Scotland Yard. In which case, criminal investigation thirteen S W. I suppose. So let's see, SW, yes. 13. No, this is Lestrade, so we don't want to go see him. New Scotland Yard, no. Public carriage, no. Special brands, Thames Division. Nine East, perhaps. I didn't expect to get to get stuck so early, but let's uh let's see if we can remedy this nice and quick. Nine East? No, no one there. Nine East, 85 Southwest. 85? No, we don't have that. 5WC? Do we have a WC here? Okay, MC. MC, WC, 5, no. Special brands, Thames Division. Where are you, friend? We're looking for just Detective Inspector Abilene, 100 EC. Here he is, the Commercial Street Police Station. I suppose we could have gone. Where should we have looked? Oh, I suppose here, police stations. So. Bow Street, Commercial Street, Lambeth, Old Bailey, Scotland Yard, Thames Division, Titchfield. Okay, we're all fine. All right, here we are. <laughs> wow, we've only got 15 leads. Okay, let's read this one. At the Commercial Street Police Station, we enter the office we were appointed to to discover a rotund man of average height, relatively young but already balding and wearing sideburns. Handsome fella. He's busy looking at Detective Fob Watch through a large magnifying glass. The item is dissembled, disassembled on the desk, and the inspector is reassembling the minute parts of its precision mechanism using a pair of fine tweezers. Inspector Adeline? Yes, come in. Allow me to finish and I'm all yours. 
Gentlemen, answers Adeline without looking up. Wiggins, and these are my colleagues. We come on behalf of Mr. Holmes for the investigation of the Whitechapel murder. A smile cracks on the investigator's face, who stops his work on the spot. You see, fixing things relaxes me. I'm yours. Abeline pulls out a black notebook from his desk. According to my preliminary investigation, Mary Ann Nichols, called Polly, was 43 years old. She was a poor unfortunate, long ago estranged from her husband, tended to drink, and as with many others in Whitechapel, forced to prostitute herself in order to get enough to pay for a night in a shelter or a room in the best case. She had been living at the White House on Flower and Dean Street for a week. She was seen around 11 p.m. the night before yesterday on Whitechapel Road, and then around half past midnight at the frying pan, a neighborhood watering hole. Then she was seen at the Thrall Street night shelter by the owner, who refused to give her a bed as she had no money and was drunk. Very generous. Um, all right, let me start. Let me start noting some of these down because we need to remember um, her whereabouts. So we've got Nickel. Oh yeah, this is this is my black notebook by the way that I just pulled out of my uh, police inspector's desk. Um, which you can imagine is just underneath um, all of these maps and magnifying glasses. Nichols, she was living in White House on Flower and Dean. I'm not going to expect you to be able to read either the text or my handwriting. So um, if you've got questions of what's going on, then pop them in the chat. Um, <laughs> just because you're going to be like, I have no idea what you're writing or reading. and um, you know, probably be quite, uh, you know, disoriented, especially if you're just joining. So, Polly Ann Nichols, the murder, or sorry, Mary Ann Nichols, called Polly, uh, 43, I should say. Um, so, she was on Flower and Dean. She was seen at 11 p.m. the night before yesterday. So, that's September. No, that would be August 30th. Um, on Whitechapel, and then half past midnight at the Frying Pan, okay, Frying Pan, which is a great name for a bar, by the way. Then she was seen at the Thrall Street night shelter, okay, Thrall Street, and 3.45 a.m. yesterday morning, that would be August 31st, Two passers-by who were headed to their work discovered her body in Buck's Row. Her dress had been hiked up to her stomach. Jeez. Then, Officer Neil, who was making his round, arrived barely a few minutes later. Could you give us the identities of the passerby who discovered the body? The one who discovered the body is Charles Cross, a carter at Pickford's. Charles Cross. Do you have a lead, Inspector? I've delegated to Lestrade the research into recent deaths under similar circumstances, as well as assaults and cases closed after the fact. He's quite confident about one specific case, Smith, and we may need to investigate on it. Nichols' murderer may have left clues which would allow us to link to these ancient cases. Come back and give me your report tonight. Holmes isn't taking part in this investigation. You can follow up to 15 leads, including this one and the ones previously followed, then move on to the questions. No pressure then, goodness gracious. So I suppose up here we should probably keep track of how many leads we are following. So right now we're at one and we've got 15 max. So actually this might not take an hour because if we've got 15 to do, then we might have to, you know, we might have to get a move on. So Charles Cross, um, I think probably would be Yep, see, there he goes again. I don't know why it does this, and it's not helpful. I'm, I'm hoping, I don't know if, um, I'm not sure if there is, I'm hoping that the, at least the sound stays on when the camera goes off, so at least you can hear my voice, and then, yeah, like, just hit me up in the chat if, <laughs> if, you, if you can't see what I'm actually doing. So... I think we have to go to Charles Cross. I think that's kind of undoubted. Um, I think we need to go find find him. And I think we need to go to Lestrade because obviously he is um, also investigating um, what what seems to be a series of murders um, in 
in the area. Um, well, he, he calls the cases the cases ancient, which is interesting. So obviously there's been a gap, um, presumably, between this case and the previous. So let's go find Charles Cross and um, and then Lestrade. So I know we can get to Lestrade from I think from here. Let's see. Um, Langdale Pike. No, 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 no. Or maybe not. I suppose we have to go find him as well. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. Um, let's go find Charles Cross. He is a, did you say a carter in, oh dear, where was he? He's a carter in Pickford's. So I think we have to go to Pickford's probably. Because um, he won't be at home, will he? He's, he'll be at work. Um, and is a carter a person who makes carts? Is that ignorant? I think maybe you must make carts. A cooper is a barrel. Cooper is barrels, right? Remember that. Carter must be carts. I, I mean, not that. Yeah, I think I think carter must make carts. Let's go to Pickford's. Um, so we need to go find Pickford's, and I suppose we can probably find it either here under P. One might imagine. Mm, Pickford's, yes, ninety-eight E C. See, that was much easier than the first one. Um, 98 EC. So we can, of course, as well, um, go, we can go, um, like we can mark our progress on the map. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. It's actually more helpful to track in terms of like distances and times it takes to get from one place to another, um, rather than like to track where you are because it doesn't really matter per se, but um, you know, just just to do it, we can we can do it. So ninety eight, I think it was, wasn't it? Ninety eight E C, which would be somewhere over ninety eighty ninety nine. Oh no, wait, that's E. Sorry, so oh, geez, ninety four, ninety six, ninety eight. There we are on Widegate Street. I'm not super super duper familiar with this part of London, but I have been. Well, I've been to Spitalfields, so I know where that is. Um, and there's like a, there's like a really, there's a really famous pub around here that has a little Jack the Ripper sign on it um, that you can follow, like the little tours if you want to, you know, if you're so inclined. Um, all right, 98 BC. I, th I think this is. I think this is the way to go. We arrived at Pickford's warehouse as looking for the man who discovered the body of Polly, and were directed to a mustachioed man waiting on his cart near the eastern exit of the building. I told you it was a cart, a cart man. Can I give him a voice? Yeah. Yeah, I was the one who found a body, not Robert, states Charles Cross, while frowning his thick, bushy eyebrows. But I've already told everything to Inspector Abeline. Yes, yes, but we're leading an independent investigation. Would you mind telling us your story? All right, he's only got about half a page, so all right. But all right, I was leaving to come to work here. I'm a carter. I have to cross all of Whitechapel. As I'm going along Bucks Row, I see a dark silhouette on the ground near the door near the stables. I thought it was a tarpaulin at first, as it was still dark out, and there was a fog on top of that this morning. I come closer, and I realise it's a woman. There was a bonnet on the ground next to her. I first thought she was drunk, so I lean over to see what happened, and at that point I hear footsteps. I turn around, and it was Robert, another carter from around here, so I call him over to come see. I touch the woman's head and see it's cold, and I tell Robert that she must be dead. To check, he places his hand on her chest and tells him that she's still breathing. She was all askew, a skirt raised to her waist. We thought she'd been outraged. We covered her up and left to go get the police. We found an officer, Mize in his name was, who was making his rounds in the corner of Embury and Old Montague. We told him what he discovered at Bucks Row, then we headed straight to work, Rob and I, by going along Embury Street. We split up a bit before Commercial Street, since Robert works at Corbett's Court. What time was it we found the body? A bit before four o'clock, I'd say I was late. Was there a lot of blood? No, I hadn't noticed any. You met no one just before? No, not that I can remember, but as I told you, it was pretty dark. In any case, I didn't see anyone else in the street. Not that helpful, um, because we we already have found out most of that from the... Goodness gracious me. I really kind of found out most of that from the paper, so I'm not sure that we really needed to go see him. So maybe that was a waste, but at least we've got we've got um, his his movements 
and and his whereabouts. So he was on Box Row, which is, I mean, who knows? It could be anywhere. But let's let's see if we can find him. So he was on Box Row, um, and he was coming. Let's see, Hanbury and Old Montague. So he was coming. Hanbury and where's Montague? John Corbett, Brick Lane. Oh, yeah, Br Brick Lane is definitely where. The, yeah, yeah. So here we go. So Hambert, Hambury and Old Montague right here. And so he must have found the body on Bucks Row, which is here. So this is right by the Whitechapel Station construction site. So, um, blah, 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 blah. so where was he? He's going along Bucks Row. Yeah, so he's like somewhere right here, number two in the E. So I suppose we could go and figure out, we could go find the you know location of the body. That might make sense. Um, Robert works at Corbett's Court. Um, so he was with Robert um, Corbett's Court. But I don't know if it's going to be worthwhile going to find him. I don't, I don't, it doesn't sound like he really saw anything that this guy didn't. Um, we could as well go to see Officer Mising, but I'm not sure how we track him down, given that he probably works at the same police station as we just went to see Commercial Street. Um, so let's see. Officer Mising, Robert in Corbett's Court, and Charles Cross. Charles Cross, I think, seems relatively credible. Um, he's got a nice mustache, so that probably means that he's not a bad guy, because um, that's, that, that's how that works, I think. Um, and, well, let's think. I think, yeah, I think we go to two, do we? I mean, we could also go see, um, what's his face? The, uh, the, the autopsy, uh, the autopsy guy, the autopsy guy, you know, that guy. Um, Robert Paul. Yep. Okay. So here he is. Yeah. The neighborhood isn't safe. Um, blah, 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 blah. Are you made it? So one of them blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, so the, yeah, the police officer wasn't very quick, but I mean, that's, you know. Um, Dr. Ralph Llewellyn um, on the old Montague Street morgue is probably where we should be going next, I think. Um, old Montague morgue, um, which is, I imagine, somewhere around here. No, maybe not. No, no. I think the, the strange thing about this is that I think we have to use both maps, which is fine, but a bit annoying. Um, South Bromley Station. Yeah, see, like, all these, there's all these docks down here, but that's not actually useful, I don't think, for us right now. Let's, um, yeah, let's go find... Hmm. Yeah, let's go find Llewellyn at the old Montague Morgue. Um, so we need to go, f go. let's go into the directory again. And we'll hit up the old Montague Morgue. If you are just joining us, um, we have discovered, well, we haven't discovered, but we found out about a murder. Um, Polly, Polly Nichols, killed at some point yesterday night, found this morning, early this morning, by a man named Charles Cross. Um, mustachioed guy, you know, fairly, fairly well, to, well, not well to do, but he's fairly, uh, fairly, fairly reasonable, you know, credible, credible witness. And we're now going to go to the morgue to see what we can see about, you know, the body itself. So I don't think there's going to be a listing for morgues, but let's, let's see if we can find, uh, theatres, restaurants, pawnbrokers, police stations, post office, prisons, Scotland Yard. I don't think it's in, I don't think it's under Scotland Yard. Somerset House, no. Um, music halls, newspapers, prisons, shoemakers, solicitors. Would it be under doctors, maybe? That would be kind of sick, though, wouldn't it? Detective agencies, no. We don't need one of those. That's us. Doctors. Llewellyn. Here we are. Dr. Ralph Llewellyn. So that's the, uh, that's our uh, more more guy, what did I just call him? A mortuist. More mortuist? Yeah, mortuist, that sounds right. M mortuary scientist. Dr. Ralph Llewellyn, 115E. Let's go check him out and see 
what he thinks happened. Because this guy said there wasn't a lot of blood, which is interesting, because we're getting sort of varied. You know, that guy couldn't even tell he was dead. You know, n no blood, right? I mean, which is weird. Because then the paper says that she was like, eviscerated, which seems to suggest there was quite a lot of blood. So, who knows? I mean, who really knows? I'm not sure. Um, I always do this where I close the book and I forget where I'm supposed to be going. So let me go back. Let me go back. Uh, we're going to Dr. Llewellyn and he is 115E. Okay. He was our E area. Oh, so he is over here. There he is. Right there. Oh, we're on Whitechapel. Well, you're not very far away, are you? And then, I, yeah, I mean, so, so I think from, if we've gone over here, we've come back over here, I mean, it makes mo the most sense for us, I think, to then head to the murder site, um, or the, the well, ah, I should say, not the murder site potentially, could just be the, could just be the site of the body, and it was placed there after the fact. I, I'm so mad at my camera. Um, let's, I'm gonna have to fix this by, uh, before tomorrow, I imagine. So, we're going to 115. Let's see what we can find out. And remember, we've only got 15 clues. We've already used two. And, uh, yeah. All right. Dr. Llewellyn lets us into his room, and he doesn't seem all that disposed to grant as much of his time. He's a stern man in the prime of his years, wearing a short beard. The walls of the waiting room in which he receives us are plastered with frames containing his degrees and honorary titles, a diploma of higher medical studies from the London Hospital, a division doctor's title from Her Majesty's Armies, a manuscript page making him a member of the British Gynecological Society. I've already made many statements to the press and to the police, and my report was sent to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, the doctor explains to his entire voice. If you want to read it, you'll have to go there. We won't bother you for long, Doctor, answers Rubens, so we might have to use another clue to go to St. Bart's, which is a bit frustrating, but okay. I mean, mate, you know, we're, we're pretty smart. Maybe we will figure this out in 15 clues. And obviously there's far more than 15 clues in this book, so there's obviously got to be a, a you know, specific few that are very helpful and a specific few that probably aren't. Anyway, we'd just like to know if you'd notice anything peculiar and if you could clarify two or three things, such as the approximate time of Marianne Nichols' death, the cause of death, and if you could tell us if she'd been killed elsewhere and dropped off in Box Row later. Ah, see? Det detective in waiting. Listen, I got there around four o'clock, with only 300 yards from Box Row, and Marianne Nichols was dead. Her wrists were cold, but her body was still warm. She'd been dead for at least half an hour, and of course it's out of the question that the wound could have been self-inflicted. There was very little blood around the neck and on the ground, blood which must have flowed into her hair and clothes. As the cause of death, the wounds to her abdomen as well as those to her throat are sufficient to cause death, which needed to determine in which order they were made. I think the victim first had her throat slashed and then was gutted once lying down. I ordered that the body might be transported to the Whitechapel morgue rather than the morgue of Whitechapel Hospice. A short time later I joined them to perform the aut autopsy. The rest is in my report. Frustrate. Llewellyn, I really just need you to have a copy of your report. I mean, I know you don't have a photocopier because we are in 1888, but it's a bit annoying I have to keep walking around London to try and get an answer. So, the report is at St. Bart's. The autopsy was done in Whitechapel Morgue rather than Morgue of Whitechapel Hospice. So I guess we could go look at the body if we wanted to, but it doesn't seem like we're going to find that much more out that we don't already know here. Um, Whitechapel Morgue. So she, and let's add a bit more detail here. So throat slit, which she says could have soaked into the hair and clothes, but that seems a bit strange to me. Then abdomen, uh, you know, Yeah, you know, bad stuff happened to the abdomen. Um, very little blood around the neck, uh, the ground, blah, blah, blah. She'd been dead for at least half an hour. So probably around about, they got there at, they got there at four, and these people found her at 3.45 when she was still alive, because she was still breathing or still had a pulse. So give that maybe 3.15, 3 o'clock. 
3 to 3.15 a.m. time of... Wait, no, hold on. If there was still a lie... Oh, no, she must... Yeah, no, she, she must have died at, like, 3.50. Um, she'd been dead at least half an hour. The wrists were cold, but her body was still warm. Around 4 o'clock. So, hang on. So they said that she was still alive at 3.45, but that doesn't really seem like it could be true if he says it's been at least half an hour. But, I mean, maybe if he, maybe if he arrived, like, after 4, who knows? Like, 4.10, maybe? So, I mean, let's just say, like, 3 to 3.45 is a time of death. That, that feels pretty reasonable to me. But now we have to go to St. Bart's, and we've used another clue. Rightio. So, should we go to the murder site, or shall we go to the hospital to get the report? Um, answers on a postcard, please. We've got, we've used one-fifth of our case, uh, case clues here, so, yeah, maybe going to the, maybe going to the, uh, maybe going to the murder site is, like, Maybe it's arbitrary at this point. Like, although I mean, we are you know we are pretty good detectives. We might find something that the police didn't. Um, you know, I think a good I think a good investigator always has to go to the scene of the crime to kind of get the feel for it. You know, um, maybe so. Then maybe we go you know we go here and then the Whitechapel Morgue. Oh, this is this is the Whitechapel Morgue. So she he went. Yeah, I mean whatever. Um, and she went to the old. Wait, she went to the Whitechapel Morgue, yeah, okay. At 24. So we could go see the body too, if we really wanted to. But I, again, I'm not sure that's necessary, given that we've already had... We're not medical doctors, right? Like, we're just... Me and Wiggins are just, like, chilling out. Um, we're just, like... We're just investigating. I think there must be some sort of timeout function on this camera that is is getting in the way quite a bit. So I, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to not have that be the case. Oh, there's the roof of my basement, a bit weird. Let's go to the murder site. I think we've got to. I think we have to go to the murder site. We, it wouldn't be a complete investigation if we didn't. So let's go 2E and here we go. Bucks Row is a sordid street that runs along the East London Railway Line train track. Uh, yeah, sure it does. It's bordered on the side by little two-story houses with rotting fronts. The walls are kept from, away from the eight-yard-wide street by a pavement, barely three feet wide. On the other side, the walls of the Schneider's Cap Factory must at night plunge the street into a darkness much more sinister than its ambience in daytime could ever suggest. We look for a place where the body of Mary Ann's Nichols was discovered. In the deserted alley near a school, we notice traces of dried blood at the foot of a door of a horse butcher's warehouse. A large round dark mask is found on the ground near the left side of the door. Wiggins attempts to push on the door without success. I'm just gonna write the word mask in big letters. We canvass the area and first meet Emma Green, a widow who lives with her daughter and her two grandsons in a little house next to the stables, in front of which the body of Mary Ann Nichols was found. My room and my daughter's overlooked the pavement where the poor woman was found. I didn't hear anything until the arrival of the police, yet I'm a very light sleeper. Okay. Our room is on the second floor of the fishmongers and overlooks the street. I went to bed at 11, woke up many times during the night between 1 and 3. My wife also slept very badly, yet the night was particularly calm. 
She was even pacing the room around 3.30, as she told the policeman. Neither one of us heard anything other than the noise of the trains. So it seems like, obviously, I don't think she was attacked in Box Row. That seems unlikely at this point. Um, the manure works. That's disgusting. Um, but that's this is basically where she is, right? She's like right around here. Um, so I, I think we have to we have to conclude that she was not killed there. Um, she was moved. Um, or at least she wasn't attacked there. Um, unless again, you know, she she was drunk, right? I mean, she was drunk. She, although this, I thought this was the day before. Um, but she was drunk, so maybe, you know, he kind of snuck up on her from behind and slit her throat, and that would be maybe quite silent. Um, but anyway, very quiet. Very quiet, this murderer. Should we go to... Should we go to read the report, then, I suppose, at St. Bart's? Let me just revisit the paper really quickly to see what, if anything, is there. Um... Let's see. This afternoon at the Working Lads Institute, Mr. Wynne Baxter will open an investigation into the death of the unfortunate woman in presence of the police authorities. In no order for the police work not to be slowed down, so they have all the advantage of having in the possession of all the information, it was decided to skip over the preliminary formalities of the investigation at this time. Any information regarding the case must be brought to the Commercial Street Police Station in Spitalfields. Okay, yeah, so that's where I could have found that's where I could have found Officer Abeline. Um, we are having to search the book five minutes at the start of the stream, so apologies for that. So let's go to St. Bart's. Um, I think I think that's the next I think that's the next place. Um, so we've been one, two, three, that was four, wasn't it? Um, so this is gonna be five this is gonna be our fifth clue, and I don't think we're very close to finding out who did it. But again, we're not really supposed to. We're we're not really supposed to find out who did it yet, because of course we don't. There's three more chapters. But at least if we can get some sort of mm, pattern or develop some sort of mm, profile on this on this murderous rampager, um, and if we can link them to the previous cases, um, then that would be helpful too. So um, let's go to St. Bart's, which is 38 EC, and let's actually read the report that uh, Llewellyn made. Uh, 38 what did I say? 38? 38 EC. Mm, okay, here we go. <laughs> After, this is funny. After having found the office of the head medical examiner empty, we go down to the basement of St. Bart's Hospital looking for the autopsy room. To our great surprise, we stumble upon a group made up of four workers and a dozen young women accompanied by children who, while eating chips and old newspaper cones, contemplate through a glass window seven bodies exposed to the gaze of all on inclined tables of black marble. The bodies are bare and wetted by rivulets of water coming from faucets located over each of the tables. Evidently, none of the visitors have come in to identify anyone. Suddenly, Sir Jasper Meeks rushes into the room and starts frog-marching this little crowd towards the exit. I'm gonna do, I think this guy needs like a, a proper like, I'm sick of these Sunday strollers who come to the morgue as if it was a day out at the zoo, fumes Meeks. How can I assist you, gentlemen? For investigating the crime which took place in Buck's Row, a certain Mary Nichols, Wiggins promptly answers. I was actually in the middle of reading Llewellyn's report, if you knew, what a mess. Two residents couldn't think of anything better to do than strip and clean the poor woman before Llewellyn's passage to imbeciles. Can you explain to me why they didn't start out by bringing the body to me here? Their morgue is no more than a quick stop on the way to a mass grave. Sure, the hospital is a bit further away, but bloody hell, it's clear that this is an unusual crime which requires the greatest of attentions. See what little information I have, my conclusions can't be much different from Llewellyn's. Sir Jasper then reads his, his colleague's report. A woman in poor condition. Five foot three, round, round. <laughs> poor Polly. Five foot three, round, roughly 43 years of age, five teeth are missing, a slight laceration on the tongue. Any marks or blows, asks Wiggins. Meeks ignores him and continues his lecture. A bruise on the lower part of the jaw on the right side of the face. This could be the result of pressure from a thumb. We can also notice a round contusion on the left side of the face, which could have been inflicted by the pressure of many fingers. Due to being strangled? asked Wiggins. No, after. 
makes sense as dryly. They're almost at cheek level. I can go with Llewellyn at their post mortem. So he's been, she's been like, she's been like grabbed. I mean, obviously, you can't see what I'm doing to my face, but she's been like grabbed with the by the face, like, like, yeah, like squeezed, except while dead, which is weird. On the left side of the neck, we can observe an incision starting directly under the ear and extending as far as an inch under the jaw. On the same side, but almost an inch lower, is the start of a circular incision, which ends three inches under the right jaw. This incision completely tore all tissues to the vertebrae. You must wonder if you didn't try to decapitate her, Wiggins exclaims. So she's been had her throat pretty well slit. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, not suitable for children. Meeks continues his lecture in a neutral tone. No blood on the chest, nor on the body, or on the clothes. Her dress would have been stained with blood, Wiggins asks in a surprised tone. If she'd have been standing, surely, but I doubt it, comments Meeks before resuming. No other wounds on the body until we come to the lower part of the abdomen. To the left, we find a large, large incision which tore the flesh. Many more incisions crisscross the abdomen. On the right side, three or four. This is Halloween, by the way. Well, this is this is you know this is, this is a Halloween part of this Halloween stream. On the right side, three or four blows are identical and go from top to bottom. The blows are delivered from left to right and could be the work of a left-handed person. All wounds are caused by a long-bladed knife, moderately sharp and used with great violence. The report ends here. Which of these wounds caused the death? That's the whole question, Wiggins. It's a point of divergence between Lowen and I. He believes the cause of death was due to the evisceration of the victim, or the deep wound that slit her throat. In my opinion, this poor woman was strangled first. At what time was she killed? I can't tell you precisely, as her temperature wasn't taken on location, curses Meeks. Nonetheless, the body was still warm when it was discovered, and Llewellyn noticed no signs of rigor mortis. She must have been discovered roughly an hour after having been killed. Unlike what you said earlier, your conclusions seem to differ from Llewellyn's. Listen, gentlemen, I don't have a habit of throwing discredit on a colleague not having been on the crime scene. However, I can't hide that some of Dr. Llewellyn's observations seem erroneous to me. Hmm, Dr. Llewellyn. Pretty suspicious, if you ask me, given that you work right here, the body was right here, and it seems like maybe you're trying to cover something up. Hmm. That's going in the notebook. It's going in the notebook, Llewellyn, you shady character. Probably not. It's probably not very shady. I mean, people weren't particularly known for their, like, Incredible knowledge of medical science in the 1800s, I suppose. So, you know, we could be we could be quite far off base there. But I remember I know from from you know previous external information that you know there is there was quite a bit of su suggestion that Jack the Ripper could have been a medical doctor, given that he was like stabby stabby, slit slit, sharp sharp, and kind of things. Anyway, so this guy says about three o'clock too. He thinks she was strangled though. Strangle question mark. Throat slit. Then eviscerated. It's lovely. Lovely, lovely stuff. We've got that is our fifth clue. And now where the heck do we go? This is the question because I mean, we've got nothing. We literally have nothing. I mean, we should. We could probably go and figure out. Maybe we go to the pub, right? Like we could go to the frying pan or go to the um, the Thrall Street uh, hostel because that's where she was seen last. But at the same time, like this seems like a kind of probably a crime of opportunity. And if we know about Jack the Ripper, we could probably probably make a guess. That he not he's not necessarily targeting her targeting her because of um, anything specific, but rather the, just that she was like there and a prostitute and maybe easy to kill, possibly intoxicated. With that said, we could go to the frying pan, um, which is in seventeen E. So where has she been? Where has she been? Seventeen E is must be somewhere over here, mustn't it? There it is, frying pan. 
how did she get from here to here? Um, and when was she seen at the frying pan? I think they said it was the day before, um, but I can't remember quite. Um, yeah, I can't quite remember. But let's see. I say we do like a couple more clues and then we call it a night from here um, and pick this up maybe tomorrow. What do you think? Um, let me know if you've just joined um, and you want to you stick around, then I'm fine to do that too. Um, but I'm not sure. Just let, hit me up in the chat. I don't know. Let me know. Let me know what you think. Um, shall we go to the frying pan? I think we should. 17E, I think, I mean, or Thrall Street, which is hostel, maybe? Is that, or an inn? I think Thrall Street, no. Hotels, Thrall Street, no. What? Insurance company? Boarding houses. Thrall Street, 18 E. Oh, okay, so right next door. So she kind of hops between the frying pan and Thrall Street um, flop house. But the Thrall Street flop house kicked her out or didn't wouldn't give her a bed because she was drunk. So... I suppose we just go to both of these, but I don't want to use up too many clues. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to use up like all my clues, chasing around something that might not be quite necessary. Let's go to. Let's go to the. Let's go to the frying pan first, I guess. I mean, we might as well get a drink while we're on it. Hey. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's a lot. I think I'm going to go to both of these because now I've kind of seen it and there's a lot on both of them. I think I'm just going to kind of cheat a little bit and be like, yeah, okay. All right. And I don't want to read this back to me. The frying pan is a sordid pub with a washed out sign on the corner of Finch Street and Brick Lane. Yeah, that, that checks out. On the doorstep, prostitutes try to find clients among the passerby. A badly shaven doorman, pipe in mouth and billy club up his sleeve, gauges us as we enter. We find a space not too far from a dirt-encrusted man, bald on the top of his head, occupied by looking above him at the gleam of a gas lamp lighting up the smoke-filled room. You see, that's, that. that's this, like, orange glow you've got going on here. All while stuffing a clay pipe with his thumb using coarsely chopped tobacco. I do like the, like, narrative literary quality of this game it is quite nice um even though this is completely erroneous information it's still quite fun to be like you know kind of encapsulated within the game um, although obviously i've just broke the fourth wall so sorry about that his clothes seem too large and his frayed cuffs are as black as his fingernails upon our arrival he begins to complain friends cohorts greetings it's because of that damn guess I'm losing my mind. And they have the balls to call this a gin palace. The barkeep, without paying the least attention to our neighbour, pauses a glass of his best rye whiskey, and Wiggins takes the chance to investigate him. He learns that Polly was here on the night of the crime. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got to I've got to imbibe myself as well, but it's only LaCroix, so I did say this wasn't suitable for children, but this is only sparkling water, so <clears throat> Polly was here on the night of the crime. She left the pub around one, alone and imbibed, after having contributed greatly to making the place more lively. <laughs> All right, good to know. As we're about to walk out the pub, a large, mature woman with a florid complexion grabs Wiggins by the arm. That is a phenomenal word. <clears throat> with her scratchy voice burned by alcohol, she whispered, Can I do this voice? You think I can? <clears throat> scratchy and burned by alcohol. <clears throat> florid and large. You're investigating Polly's murder, young man? Yes, miss, answers Wiggins. They call me Pearly Pole. I think she was killed by a man who has a grudge against the prostitutes of Whitechapel. I was a, I was a friend of Martha Tabram, you know, the one who was murdered at the 67 George Yard building. And earlier, other girls have been assaulted in the neighbourhood. It's a Nichols gang turf here, but we haven't seen them much since August. They were there then to wring money for us, but as soon as they danger, we don't feel too protected anymore. These are the girls. Can we meet them? 
go get a notebook. Martha Tabram, 67 George Yard. I know who won. She was called Belinda Wishart. I haven't seen her in the pub for a while, but I think she still lives in the neighborhood. Where exactly? I wouldn't be able to tell you. Thanks for your help, Curly. We leave the tavern, and outside, a thick, soot-laden fog has swept over the streets. Belinda Wishart. She lives in the neighborhood somewhere. Um, this one is dead. This one not dead question mark we're not sure um i'm going to circle the word mask so i remember that um and she left oh yeah and she left the pub she left the frying pan what time one did we say yeah one left at 1 a.m now this is where it can help to have the like um this is where it can help to have the uh, like the scale here. I think you can you can see that. Yeah, you can just see that. So on the bottom here, there's a scale. So this entire bar is six minutes walking. So I mean, she's not far, right? Like so, from here to here is probably what a fifteen minute walk max. Like six, twelve, maybe twenty minutes. I mean, I suppose she's drunk, so maybe give her an extra ten for stumbling. But she could have walked here in about half an hour and got to here by about two. But again, I'm not convinced that she actually was killed in Bucks Row. So we're going to have to figure that out too. I think we now, we do have to go to the Thrall Street lodging house because, yeah, I, I think we've got to go because, of course, that's, when her, that's where her friends are going to be, right? Probably, if she's, if she's lived there for a while. Um, and, you know, that's we know she was there. So maybe there's stuff that does tell her about why she might be targeted other than um, prostitution. So let's figure it out. We'll make this the last clue, and then we will uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow night. And hopefully, the conclusion. I mean, we're we're what we're we're well, seven clues in, so that's about halfway. <clears throat> Between Commercial Street and Brick Lane, we enter narrow streets in search of the Thrall Street lodging house. In place, in pl oh, we've got a typo. <clears throat> In places, blood coming from nearby slaughterhouses flows freely over the ground. An errant dog is taking advantage of that and is licking the pavement. Halloween. I'm telling you. We're, we're going full Victorian horror. Stepping into a short alleyway, we're forced to pull out our handkerchiefs to protect ourselves from the pestilential smell of the stench, which, coming from the nearby slaughterhouse, wafts over to us. The neighborhood in itself is formed by a mass of houses of three or four stories, which seem to have built, been built with no plans, each inhabited from the basement to the attic, forming gaps so narrow that one could cross the alleyway by going from one window to the next. Luke, the locksmith of our small band, who spends his in this thieves' den of a neighborhood, doors are useless, as there's nothing to steal. It's in the middle of this dialus that we find the Thrall Street Doss House. God, this is... I just, what brilliant, brilliant writing. We enter into a vast kitchen, smoky from the chimney, de oh, smoky from the chimney detached from the brick wall. The beams in the ceiling have been darkened by soot. A bare bones iron gas pipe feeds a lone lamp in the middle of the table. It's the only source of light, other than the fireplace around which wet clothes are set. Pensioners, surrounded by children of all ages kneeling by the fire, are grilling herrings, which puts out a strong smell, while others are drying cigar stumps. On the whitewashed walls are written in large characters a few precepts, which preach resignation. The earth is a veil of tears. Blessed be those who leave it. Do not look above yourself, but beneath you, and miserable though you may be, you will find more miserable still. Jesus. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, then. Pretty dark. The manager, an imposing man in his 60s, is settled on a stool not far from the chimney. 
He's badly shaven, bloated by alcohol, and wears an old hunting jacket, which is worn and torn to the skin. Today I have a lead cap with a cast iron visor, he complains, while gazing at his cooked meal and clearly regretting the amount he imbibed the night before. Polly lived here for a bit with her friend Nellie the Telegraph. We'd call her that as she first wanted to spread rumors. Polly stayed here for three weeks. She wasn't unfortunate, but she kept her smile and her good mood. How many times did I have to credit her a meal or a bed? Now, Polly, she could never hold down a job, so she ended up prostituting. But lately, she didn't pay anymore. So when she came back from the frying pan, half drunk and without a penny on the night of the 30th, I refused to give her a bed. She left at around 1.40, promising to come back and pay and asking me to keep a bed for her. She was all happy and wouldn't stop boasting about having a funny new bonnet. That's the last thing she told me. You know who's the bastard that ended her? No, we're leading our own investigation. This Nelly, you know where you can find her? The poor woman is snoring her flea box as we speak. She's alone and has much trouble paying her dues. If you could give her a hand, you'd be kind. Yes, let's go up and see her. Give me what the telegraph owes directly. It'll keep her from spending it down her gullet at the pub. Yeah. Seems like he's kind of like trying to uh, like extort us for money, but I will go along with this. So, um, left here at 140. So I mean, actually, the, the the window of time is getting is getting slimmer. So from between one forty to about three fifteen is when we think she was probably killed. So that's only like an hour and twenty minutes. So and if she spent twenty minutes actually getting here, or at least close to here, then we're we're we're, we're in the region of a you know about you know two to three a.m. One would one would imagine. We give a few extra pence to the manager, asking ourselves if he would actually deduct it from Nelly's tab. <laughs> yeah, that was the source of thinking. He ends up stacking up, arming himself with a lantern and guides us to the first floor. We discover a filthy dorm room in which are stacked in bunks similar to coffin poor women. The manager wakes up a woman in her fifties with a worn face and sunken eyes, without care, much like the rest of the room. With a tired tread, Nelly joins us in the stairway. The manager goes back down and leaves us in darkness. We apologize for having to woken up and explained her the reason for her visit. Oh, you should have warned me of your coming. I would have cleaned up my face like you did yesterday for Inspector Aberline, answers Nellie the Telegraph, smiling despite her fatigued state. I don't know why I gave her like a, a, a Cornwall accent. It doesn't really make sense, does it? Can you tell us about Poggy? Poggy? Polly, asks Wiggins. Oh, yes, of course, answers Nellie in a half tone, obviously moved. Polly would often ask me to reserve a mat for her here. I liked her despite her character. She found herself alone, with no man, I mean, as much because of her moods as due to the drink. She had five kids, but it had been years since she'd seen one of them, you know, alcohol. No one really had a reason to throw stones at her. We felt a bit safer with the Nichols gang in the area, a bit more than with the Bobbies. Nellie suddenly stops, and says, Did you see her for the last time? asked Wiggins. It was right before, oh, when I think about it. I met her by luck around 2.30 in the morning at the corner of Osborne Street and Whitechapel Road across from the, across from the church. It was raining cats and dogs. I was coming back from the docks where I'd be watching the fire at the Shadwell warehouses. The rain wasn't enough to quench the blaze. The sky was red and there was lightning. I did read about that in the paper. I didn't read it out loud, but we did see that there was a warehouse fire somewhere. Mm. Yeah, there he is. Terrible fires erupted in the night of last August 30th. The first began in the Gibson Co. construction workshop. It entirely destroyed a sailboat. The second started on the docks in the southeast of Whitechapel, the buildings of the East Indies Company, which, among other things, contained stocks of brandy and gin. They have entirely burnt down. Goodness gracious. A travesty. A travesty. <laughs> All right, so she saw it at 2.30 in the morning. Osborne and Whitechapel across from the church. Um, um, met Polly Osborne and Whitechapel at 
230. And let's put 230 here, and then Osborne Whitechapel. I'm not going to be able to remember my own codes, but you know, we're just going to go with it. So Whitechapel is here, and Osborne is here. What should we be here at 230? She was kicked out at 140 from Thrall Street, which is literally here. That's six minutes to get here. So was she just like, wait? Oh, I suppose she probably went and go to like try and find uh, a punter um, in order to come back and, uh, you know, uh, pay her, pay for a bet. So I'm guessing that probably um, after this lady Nelly left, she finds a punter, but unfortunately it's, uh, you know, someone who was actually set on murdering her. Um, let's see. Did he use raining cats and dogs? Polly was drunk. She was staggering along the wall. I went to see her, and she explained to me that she'd earned three times the amount needed to pay for a bed, that she spent everything at the pub. She didn't want to go... She didn't want to go to a penny sit-ups. Well, I've heard about these. Okay, so it, um, I think what that is, and you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they used to string like rope from wall to wall um and if you've been if you got too drunk um you didn't you couldn't afford a bed you could pay a penny and you would like sleep kind of bent over this rope um so you like you like lean on the rope and it would like hold you up a little bit so instead of like sleeping against the wall you're like sleeping over a rope and so you could fit like a bunch of people on the rope and i think that's why it only cost a penny because it's obviously like a terrible way to sleep um I think that's what that is, but I could be wrong. She didn't want to go to a penny sit-up, so I begged to come back with me, but she still wanted to earn the four pennies to pay the sleep merchant. I'll be back soon, she told me. The church's clock began to toll. If the church's clock began to toll, then wouldn't it be three? Um, I saw her stagger towards Whitechapel Road, and then she disappeared into the darkness. If only she'd listened to me. Oh, well, it must be 2.30 if it was tolling out there, so 2.30 exactly. Did you know her former husband? No, I never saw him, but Polly had told me about him. He was called William and stopped paying her a pension long ago when he learned she was prostituting herself. The last time she saw her ex-husband was two years ago at the burial of her brother who died burned alive because of the explosion of a paraffin lamp. What? He'd gotten the kids a few years ago when he learned that Polly lived with Thomas. Thomas? Thomas Drew, a blacksmith who has his shop between Raven Row and Whitechapel Road. She'd gotten a crush on him at the time, and their thing lasted a few years, but it ended badly. She didn't have any new friends. Not as far as I know. As we're about to go down the stairs, Wiggins turned back and speaks one last time to Nellie. I almost forgot. We paid your tab to the manager. He played Wiggins. Smiles. Thomas Drew, is it worth is it worth going to meet him? An ex-lover? Possibly. Possibly not. I mean, who was the lady who said Pearly Paul? So Pearly Paul said there's someone obviously with a, a grudge against prostitutes. Oh, sorry, the camera's gone off again. So Pearly Paul says there's obviously someone with a grudge against prostitutes. That that seems to suggest that it's not just like one person. Um Oh, it's not just like a, sorry, like a person with like a vendetta against a single person, but a, a man with a vendetta against, you know, just the prostitutes in general. I mean, I suppose it could be that somebody that, you know, knew uh, Polly was, you know, I don't know, like, You know, it was like so mad that she took to prostituting that they decided to kill all prostitutes. I mean, that's that, uh, possible, I suppose, but, but somewhat unlikely. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. What do we think? Do we think we should go? Um, all right. 
let's do this. I think it's time to end the stream for tonight. We've got a good hour of crime solving. We've got a good page of notes. And I'm going to go away and think about what we should be doing later. Um, if we should follow the route of Thomas, if we want to go, um, oh, I don't know, maybe talk to Officer Misen. I, I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that's less useful. But we've got plenty. We've got seven left. And I think we've got actually a decent amount into the story in terms of um, the women we spoke to and the evidence or the, the information we've got on Polly herself. And we have a pretty decent timeline of her like whereabouts uh, over the night of August 30th into the morning of September 1st. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to find out if we can expand that a little bit um, as we go. I mean, we've got her up to 2.30 right here by the church. And then she walked off into, you know, walked off down Whitechapel Road. So presumably she's heading east and coming up this way where she was found. But, you know, we could be wrong. Anyway, I think that's where we'll leave it. I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do is same time tomorrow, if nothing else comes up, I think that should be, um, that should be pretty good. So let me know if you want to see more, if you have any ideas where we should go, if you want to tell me what I'm doing wrong, if I've missed anything, if you've got suspicions or mm, theories, then, uh, then hit me up, put them in the comments or in the chat. I think you can still chat or leave comments after this goes like onto the YouTube, like not live. Anyway, that is going to be it from me. Thank you so much for joining me for this kind of uh, impromptu-ish YouTube streaming session. Um, I'm going to try and get better at this. I'm going to try and, I've got a green screen that I might try and set up and we'll see if that works. I don't have like a, a Sherlock Holmes costume or anything like that, but you know, maybe that'll be nice. I don't know. We'll see. Um, anyway, if you're not, do consider subscribing for more solo board gaming content, more Halloween themed uh, streaming while coming tomorrow at least. And then, you know, we can play some more spooky games. That sounds fine with me. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching. And until next time, I will see you later.